Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this narration of a book called The Introduction to Human Biology, taken from Reddit. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Nasona rushed along the narrow corridors of the space station, her talent trying to find purchase on the metallic floor to speed her up. It was futile, however, as they merely slid off the superior alloy. She knew she'd be late for class again. Decidedly, she needed to work more on her sleeping pattern, but her findings had kept her awake all night. Entering the science lab, she quickly took her seat, hoping to not get noticed, but to no avail. Others would gladly kill her to have the chance she had to attend the prestigious Tarmina Academy, the only of its kind, an orbital station devoted to the training of elite students. Simply graduating from here meant opportunities came to you, not the other way around. Being late was completely unacceptable, and she mentally kicked herself for it. Stayed up late again, Lasona, shot out the teacher, Mrs. Maldron, an octopus type of alien species, and their science teacher. Lasona meekly nodded, trying not to cause a scene. Satisfied with the class attendance, Mrs. Maldron began her lecture. Well, I'll forgive you since you got some special material to cover today. Have any of you ever heard of a species called humans? The students conferred amongst each other, whispering back and forth, but found no answer. Mrs. Maldron was slightly disappointed, but the odds that they would know were very slim. Well, I suppose even geniuses can get stumped once in a while, she thought. She was about to spoil the details when Lysona was lifted up a paw. The teacher gestured to her direction with her tentacles, giving her permission to speak. Humans are a new species found in the corner of Sector C7-B. They are bipedal and are on path to soon discover FTL travel. She clasped her tentacles together, beaming with pride. Excellent! That is the gist of it, yes. I'm surprised you know about them. Until yesterday, they were classified information. Well, the information may have been classified. Having a father who's an ambassador to the Federation can certainly help with that. Lysona spent a bit of time browsing her father's personal files while he was busy finding out about humans last night. The teacher continued on, drowning Lysona from a train of thought. In fact, today we will be learning about human biology and anatomy. It is a rather interesting topic in and of itself, but even more so because they are nothing like we have ever seen on pre-FTL species. This piqued the students' interest and curiosity. Notably, the militaristic ones who were always out looking for new foes and their weaknesses. Let us begin with the basics then. In order to properly talk about humans, since most of our information on them comes from records of their planetary wide available resource network, you will need to understand measurements as it pertains to them. It is much simpler to explain the length of human minute for a human centimeter than translate in every particular scenario. Reaching for her computer with her tentacles, Mrs. Maldron activated a program that displayed the information on the students' portable computers. Now that we have that established, humans are bipedal creatures, as Lysona explained. Furthermore, they can be categorized as mammals. They possess two appendages that they refer to as arms. These arms have a hand which enables them to complete complex motor tasks in lieu of other adaptations such as technology or telekinesis. For moving, they stand on two legs, which are balanced with feet. On every foot is five individual toes, a toe being a smaller limb that helps them with balance. One of the students raised a wing. You have a question? Yes. So they've only recently been discovered. Have we been looking into them for some time and only recently disclosed this information? I'm afraid that I'm not at liberty to disclose that, as this information is still under level 2 quarantine. Now back to their biology. The humans have an endoskeleton, its body resting on these bones. Human bones are primarily made of calcium, but other materials like collagens, phosphates, and trace amounts of other substances. These bones, depending on the density and their purpose, can withstand up to 8,000 kilos of weight before being crushed. Naturally, much less force is required to shatter one or cut through one. The teacher spotted another question. A student raising an antennae, questioning the, and granted the student permission to speak over the wave of her tentacles. Do they use these bones as weapons? Hmm. 
As a basic and crude weapon, yes, humans can close their hands to form a blunt object and strike with it. This strength lies in throwing objects, however, using superior accuracy and speeds than most other species on their planet. They are able to achieve these speeds due to muscle elasticity and various other factors such as length of arms and the way their bodies can twist and rotate. One of the military students, John, quickly asked a question. So they are predators? Yes and no. Hunting played an important part of their earlier years, but they also eat flora. They are an omnivore. They can forgo meat just like they can eat both. They are quite adaptable, to be honest. Back on topic, a human can lose a limb without suffering great loss to if it treated in a reasonable amount of time. The students expressed shock and outrage at the notion, many feeling their own appendages protectively, as if they were also at risk of being cut up. They can just grow them back. They do not grow back, no. However, human bodies are quite receptive to and have no reaction to many materials. As such, they often replace lost limbs with fake ones, made from wood, metals, or various other polymers. Such replacements usually reduce function of said limbs slightly. But in some cases, the prosthetics have shown to be an improvement upon the human's ability. To demonstrate, she called up the previous student who had asked the question, the yarn. Say to Malk, what happens if in an accident the pincer would break off? Um, well, slow and painful death as all liquid pulls out of my husk. Perhaps if a trained medical officer was nearby, say 200 heartbeats away, there could be a chance to patch it. Even after surviving, however, the integrity of my shell would still be compromised. I'd likely become a pariah, shunned by family and society. The teacher nodded, knowing what the answer was, but wanting to let the other students also hear firsthand. In some cases, for organ-related damages, humans can also receive a donation from another human in order to replace said organ. I know what you'll ask, but no, they do not kill another one in order to harvest it. Some organs have redundancies, and humans can part with an extra one. Other times, the recently deceased human organs can be made available to transplant. Recently, in their history too, they have begun making synthetic organs with some varying degrees of success. So far, only the head, where the brain is located, cannot be saved in such ways. This, however, has not stopped them trying. Scoffs and various insults flew from the more religious species, condemning this as a barbaric axe only soulless savages would do. Please calm down. Now I have a video to show you. This is not for the faint of heart, however, and you may be excused if it proves too much for you to endure. The video began playing on every student's personal computer, showing a strange creature tied to a wooden apparatus. Other of the same creature surrounding it, many with rudimentary contraptions in their hands. Audio is heard. The creatures speak to one tied up and they seemed unsatisfied with the reply, using the tolls to strike at it. Scouring deep gashes into its body, a red liquid seeping out. One of the creatures approaches the bound one and uses a metal tool, tying it to one of the creature's small limbs. It speaks gibberish again and proceeds to pull hard on the metal object, tearing off the creature's limb, drawing great cries of distress and pain from it. Quite a few of the students turn off the displays in disgust, two of them exiting the room and looking pale. The video continues on for some odd minutes, the creatures becoming ever creative in the ways of inflicting pain on the other. At one point, electricity is fed into the creature, causing it to convulse as if possessed. One of the students vomits at this point, causing the teacher to pause the video. I believe that is enough, yes. It goes on for another 22 human minutes, culminating in the aggressors using a primitive kinetic weapon to throw a metal arrow into the head of the tied-up human. This is a picture of a said human ten years later. It survived the ordeal. One of the military students banged its claws on the desk in front of it. What? This is absurd! No creature could survive such torture! The video was verified as authentic. Another student, nearly in tears, spoke up. What did that pure thing do to deserve such punishment? The context of this video was that this was an interrogation of a prisoner and to extract information from it. C couldn't they have simply plugged it up to an MVC? 
The humans have not yet discovered how to build a memory visualization computer yet. Where did you really get this video and all of the information on their anatomy and biology? There's no way this was up on their communications network. Indeed. For better or worse, the humans have this fascination with preserving history. They collect even the most trivial things such as flags from the past walls and even rations from said walls. We were able to collect most of this information on our own in order to make sure that it was accurate, but when we contacted them, they also provided much the same information. They did not hide much. We've made contact with them then, and they volunteered this information willingly. Not even the yarn have told us how their biology works, and we've been allied for 400 years. There are two pervading theories on why the humans shared this information so openly. The first goes that the humans love to share everything and want to learn the same about us. They assume that because they were open, we will be as well. The other is that it is a form of psychological warfare, making us scared of them. The student that had been agitated calmed down, sitting back down and talking to himself. How can we even kill them? One of his fellow military students tried to reassure him. Hey, maybe the humans could survive on a death world. Worst case, we throw them on one. Hearing that, the teacher chimed in. Wonderful observation. They are actually from the only known Category 5 death world. Isn't that fascinating? A student at the back raised a twig, asking a question. But are death worlds again? I figured some of you wouldn't know this. The non-death world species tend to gloss over it. They are environments in which there are active threats to primary sapient species of a planet. For example, the noir sitting in the back there with the sharp fangs comes from a Category 1 death world. There are large thunderstorms on his home planet that can be fatal. Mrs. Moulton drank a bit of water, clearing her throat. <clears> throat> a Category 2 death world would have two types of threats to life for a primary advanced species of the planet. Threats can be classified in their own subcategories such as Flora, aggressive plants that may poison or purposely try to kill. Fauna, strong predators that can eat or kill, but also smaller creatures that may also have toxins or poisons. Diseases, such as viruses and dangerous bacteria. The environment, the storms on Noir's planet, dangerous temperatures and many other disasters. And finally, outside of the planet's environment, such as powerful radiation, common asteroids or meteorite striking of the planet. A Category 5 planet like Earth, which is what the humans named their home world, has all of these above threats. Perhaps we will even have to reclassify it as a Category 6 because of the immense biodiversity of Earth. It is hard to put an exact number on it, but there is something like 8 million different species on Earth when accounting for flora and fauna. Compared to some of our worlds, like Veltuna, which boasts 237 different species, it is a few orders of magnitude higher. The class sat silently, overwhelmed by the information it had been given. Now imagine growing up with a flora that can kill you, storms and icy conditions, or even the sun or asteroids can. On top of that, creatures that are neither your prey or predator, simply killing you out of indifference or because of fear, and not only surviving on this planet, but becoming the dominant species. This is what makes humans so interesting. You say, eight million species, but what kind of climate could accommodate all that? Great question. The various zones of Earth can vary from minus 70 degrees up to as high as 50s. Every biome contains its own specific species that live within the ranges of the climate there. This is due to their distance from their star and the warmth of it. Humans can live from minus 60 to plus 60, but prefer moderate temperatures ranging from 0 to 30. Lysona raised a claw to ask a question. What about population-wise? Currently, there are around 12 billion humans. Reproduction-wise, the female of the species will produce an offspring inside of her, carrying it until birth as mammals do. This process lasts 10 human months on average. The yarn sensed an opening for something that would affect a possible war. How many offspring and how often can they reproduce? Usually a singular offspring per bearing although two and three aren't unheard of, with more than four being edge cases. The female may begin a process anew as soon as the previous offspring is born. If the focus was population, they could likely double their current population in two years. 
They can have offspring after maturity, usually counted at 16 in human time. However, many wait later in life when the station is more determined, from the 20s to the 30s. The females have up until their late 40s, and the males are always fertile. Well, we're on the general topic. Humans can live up to 140 years, but most pass away due to other complications before that. Why are we even studying them if they aren't FTL and live very far away? I was hoping to tell you at the end of the week, but they now possess FTL drives, taken from some of the Federation ships. There was a small conflict due to a misunderstanding in which the humans seized three vessels. No loss of life occurred, and we have begun talks with them. She took a long pause, letting the students digest the news before she had to tell them the rest. Many were clearly in denial. Their reaction similar to learning that a creature from a horror movie was on the loose. In matters that concern us more directly, four human students will be joining the academy next week. Anyhow, we still have five classes before they are due to arrive, and we will learn more of them in time. This will be all for today. You are excused. If any of you have concerns, I suggest you contact your species diplomat aboard the station. The students exited the class, a mix of apprehension, outrage, and sadness exuded from their demeanor. Few seemed to be thrilled by the news, all save for one, Lissana. After everyone left, she approached Mrs. Muldron with some trepidation. I was wondering if I could have a copy of their network to help study them more before their arrival, of course. For science, well, it is being made public information, so I don't see the harm... I'm glad to see that you take an interest in this, Lysona. Most of your fellow students could learn something from you. Here, I'll do a direct transfer to your school email. Lysona thanked the teacher, hurrying to get out of the class. She went straight to her lodgings, fearing to be unable to control her body. She recalled last night how she found it interesting looking up the human so-called internet on her father's computer, from the classified files that pertain to their species. She had wandered aimlessly for a few minutes, looking for anything out of the ordinary. She even searched for her own species, but to no avail. Of course, they wouldn't know her species name, as she had then thought, what she would have to do to search by description. Scales, claws, talons, wings, and horn. The results had astounded her. The humans had a word for her kind. Dragon. She was amazed. No other species yet encountered had created art of her species without beating them. She only had a few minutes before her father came back, however, so she hurried in her browsing. It was then that she found the unthinkable. The humans had even drawn her kind as some kind of sexual fantasy. She was quite a take back. A few more searches and she realized something crucial by which she found on their internet. Humans would mate with almost anything. For a species like hers, where mating occurred once every century and more focus was spent on wealth accumulation, this was quite the finding. Her tongue danced excitedly inside her more, hoping, hoping there'd be few males in the four students coming to the Tarmina Academy. End of chapter. Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Dark Machine, Bezik, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Astrea the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.